Welcome to the Center for Israel Education's ongoing analysis of the Hamas-Israel war. I'm Ken Stein, the president of the Center and an Emory University Emeritus Professor of Middle Eastern History. And I am delighted to be joined today by four highly intelligent, very respected pulpit rabbis from across the world. Bruno Frosen, the chief rabbi of Metz in France, Lauren Filson Lapidus of the Temple in Atlanta, the Reform Congregation. David Seth Kirshner of the Conservative Congregation Temple Emmanuel in Northern New Jersey. And Rabbi Adam Starr of Orthodox Congregation Or HaTorah in Atlanta. Today's webinar is the 13th in our regular Wednesday series, Analyzing the Hamas-Israel War. We're gonna try and get the view from the pulpit as we seek to learn from rabbis in the diaspora what this war's impact has been on them and on their respective communities. A word about the center. Last year, we had 1.8 million users to the website, including those who read Spanish and Hebrew. You'll find crisp analyses as we collate the best materials and create annotated bibliographies. And I will say that just this morning, I updated our annotated bibliography on the war, so you'll be able to get the best contemporary readings we've been able to find in English on the website for you to look at at your leisure. Realizing that your congregants are not homogeneous, how did you respond and how did your community respond to the events of October 7th? I want to share a little bit about the temple in Atlanta. A lot of what I'm going to share is, I think, consistent with Reformed Jewish principles and congregations in North America. We are pluralistic. We are social justice forward. The temple has a long history. It's 157 years old and a long history of activism going back to the civil rights movement. We are politically diverse. I would not say it's an even spread, but especially when we look at Israel, we see a lot of diversity of how people are engaged with the politics around it. And then that has its own implications for domestic policy. And also in reform movements, we have a lot of diversity within the community. We at the temple estimate that about 40% of our member families identify as interfaith, meaning one partner was not born Jewish. And even if they convert, they're still extended family that is understood to be interfaith. We have a significant racial, ethnic, and gender diversity. And so all of this comes together to create a picture that when we're talking about Israel, we're talking about intersectionality. We are mindful that how people are responding to October 7th in some ways represents the communities that they have felt closest to. There have been various moments where our congregation has, I think for Reformed Jews especially, has had to grapple with the particular to the universal. We are so firmly established in the idea that through social justice and interfaith partnerships and all of our work in the community, we are working together in shared values. But then to discover that those shared values may not still be held in partnership and friendship after October 7th has been really challenging for many of our congregants. I would summarize what I've reflected to a lot of people this way. We believe that all human beings are B'Tselem Elohim. We're so, of course, devastated by the images we are seeing from what's happening in Gaza. And our hearts are even more with our fellow Jews. And so to feel this sense of my community first, my people first, for a lot of congregants, I think it's the first time that they have felt that in such a powerful way. Yeah. And it's an uncomfortable place to be in certain ways. So we're a Orthodox congregation in which uh, we're proudly also religious Zionists. That is a big part of our identity, being connected to Israel and feeling that Israel is part of our religious identity, even though we are here in the diaspora. We have about five families regularly on Shlichut that live in our community for approximately three, four, five years, working in some of our partner institutions like at the Atlanta Jewish Academy and also doing work for the synagogue. And they spend three to five years bringing a taste of Israel to our congregation through education and otherwise. So when October 7th hit, this is really personal. This is really close. I walked into shul 
and the news spread very, very quickly. And these shlichim were talking about, are they going back? A cut, two of them actually went to serve in the army on Miluim. And it's not just the shlichim. Almost every single person has some relative or very, very close friend in Israel. So this is not like a foreign conflict for us. And I think that's also hard for the non-Jewish world to fully grasp. Like these are people we know extremely well. I have two brothers there and that's almost everybody in the congregation has some connection to that degree. And I think almost all of us know somebody who was unfortunately killed either on October 7th or fighting in Sahal, or at least know somebody who knows somebody. So it's really personal. And in many ways, we're still reeling. Bruno, tell us a little bit about Metz. We know it's got a Jewish population of about 2,000 to 2,500. The Jewish community of Metz, it's a very old Jewish community. We have a Jews here from the Middle Ages, Roman times. We have a very old synagogue built in 1850. So it's a very old community with a different kind of Jews, local Jews from Germany, from France, Jews from Eastern Europe and Sephardic Jews who come from Algeria. Mess, it's not an exception. I mean, all the Jewish community in France are very Zionist, pro-Israeli. A lot of people have family in Israel. Myself, I have four children living in Israel. So we are also very, very close to Israel. And what's what happening in France after the 7 October? First of all, we have a reaction from the non-Jews we are very close to the Christian people, but we have also reactions with anti-Semitism coming mostly from the Muslim community, which is very, very huge and large all over France and also in Metz. So that's the situation now. We have not a lot of manifestation of anti-Semitism in our city, really, but we have a lot of manifestation in uh, bigger city like Paris or Lyon or Marseille. People now, we are praying every day for our soldier in Israel. We have made a lot of ceremonies with the officials from the city and with the elected deputies to support Israel, and we try to do the best. People in your community after October 7th, are they as keen to stay in Metz as they were before? We hear the stories of Parisian Jews or Jews elsewhere in France thinking that they should seriously consider going on Aliyah. Yeah. As I told you, we have not a lot of manifestation of anti-Semitism in Metz. We have every Shabbos, every Saturday, a pro-Palestinian demonstration, but there are about 100 people, so it is not a lot. So people are not so frightened in Metz. But some of them are thinking about moving to Israel. Why? Because nobody here in Metz and all over France could put his children in the public school. It's impossible. Even Jews who are not religious are choosing to put their children in a, a religious school, in Jewish school, and on places where there are no Jewish school, in Catholic schools. So this is one of the reasons uh, the people are thinking about leaving the city. Not a lot yet, not a lot yet, I, I have to say, but some people are saying that they have no future for the youth in France, for the Jewish youth in France. So our place in, is in Eretz Israel, it's in Israel. And well, myself, I've sent my, my four children then, so I cannot say anything against this. Another point which seems very, very important, it's that the, the city of Metz, we have got a lot of support from the Christian people. We have a lot of support from the politics and from the Christian peoples. And we have also a very strange phenomena here in France, all over France, even in Metz. The, the left politicians like Socialist Party, uh, which even was to de there to defend the, the minority, they are really against Israel. So we have very bad relationship with them. And the right party, including the extreme right, the party of Madame Le Pen, his father was anti-Semite, Jean-Marie Le Pen, 
he was denying Shoah and so on. But the Deutsche, which is now at the head of this extreme right party, which the polls show will be the first French party in the next uh, European elections, they are very pro-Israeli. So we are a little bit disappointed because the things are moving. And some Jews uh, are thinking about uh, why not voting for the extreme right? I am against this, but this is a situation because they are becoming very pro-Israeli. So that situation in Metz, one point more I, I will add and I will finish. We have to know that in front of our synagogue, and our school, there is an army morning and evening every day, uh, including Shabbos, when there is a service, that are coming to keep us. And this is not from the 7th of October, but from what's happening in the Jewish school in Toulouse in 2012, when they killed the Jewish children in Toulouse. So we have now all the police, all the army, keeping the synagogue every day from terrorism. It was a cataclysmic event, not only for Israel, but I think for world Jewry. Our synagogue is a conservative one that is right down the middle. And it's down the middle politically. It's down the middle on the conservative movement. Uh, the one thing we're not down the middle on is we are fiercely Zionistic. 70 to 80 percent of our speakers are Zionists in nature, meaning what they're coming to talk about is related to Israel, whether they're from Israel or supportive of Israel or talking about or teaching about Israel. The response has ironically yielded more membership for our temple. People who felt disconnected or had left our synagogue in previous years have come back. Anti-Semitism has this really strange effect in that when it increases, it strengthens the Jewish world. And when it dissipates, it weakens us. And that's a strange paradox for us. And our congregation, we responded in a host of ways. So we bought about 4,000 lawn signs and blanketed our communal area with every store and home that says we stand with Israel with a large Jewish star on it. We've had six different speakers come from Israel, Eli Beer, Nachman Shah, Jonathan Greenblatt is not from Israel, but talking about anti-Semitism and the list goes on. Survivors of October 7th, those who are families of hostages come to our synagogue. This Saturday night, I'm leaving on my fourth mission to Israel, mainly with members of our community and congregation. We've done a very focused fundraising campaign just for Israel with no overhead, where we raised $2 million in three months. Our community has hosted families that have been displaced from the North and the South, both short-term and long-term, and we've helped with the funding for them in day schools and at JCC events. And everything as little as having our religious school kids make cards for soldiers who've been injured. And it has a tremendous effect as someone who stands in the hospital every other week these days with wounded soldiers, seeing their rooms plastered with kids from North Carolina and kids from Chicago and kids from Denver making signs saying we love you, it actually makes a tremendous impact. Our area in Bergen County has one of the higher saturation rates of Israelis. And as a result of that, it has really touched a very sensitive nerve for our community in general. And these are just some of the areas where we have tried to be responsive as a synagogue and a community. In fact, I was remarking that I'm delivering the sermon this week, and it's probably the first time that my sermon is not focused on Israel in three months. It's gonna be about the power of words. Do your respective communities understand not only the horrific nature of what transpired on October 7th, the Israeli reaction to this has been not just one of how many people were killed or how horrendous it was, but there's a sense of this was an existential event that threatened my very existence and the existence of the state that I thought I would have for the rest of my life. We just celebrated a 75th anniversary. And this really punctured the balloon of Israeli consciousness that they were secure. Do your communities get that? Do they get the difference between seeing this just as a picture or just as numbers, but as a sense of this cuts to my very core of my identity? Absolutely. I mean, there is so much fear and anxiety and concern. Congregants are, are really, really struggling. It, it, it has affected them to an emotional core. And I think it's also in light of the anti-Semitism that's going on around this, 
people are really questioning their place here in America. It's interesting, I, I would say many of my congregants are drawn more to Israel, even though that's where the attack took place, as feel like that's our only true and safe home. So I think people have been deeply, profoundly affected. I think like all of us and the sense of comfort and security that we had, both as Jews in America and as it relates to the state of Israel, has been shattered in a very significant way. There is no question in my mind that October 7th has created the existential angst that you're talking about for our entire community. I will say I have never in my 16 years here as a rabbi felt so much the responsibility to help care for the grief and the anguish and the fear that our congregants are feeling. And it's taken a variety of modes. We are a Zionist congregation. I think that sometimes their perceptions about Reformed Jewish communities and their commitment, I would say that the temple lays those to rest pretty quickly. The way that people have shown up for one another, the way they have encouraged and called out people, our neighbors who have not necessarily been alongside us, has been profound. People are eager to help. We've had to postpone our larger family and B'nai Mitzvah and teen trips. And there were a lot of people who were looking forward to their first time in Israel and are now wondering when they'll go and what that will look like. I started by two months ago a series of conversations about anti-Semitism in Israel, just to provide a space for people to come and share what they were thinking and feeling. And anti-Semitism was on our radar before October 7th, but what I'm hearing now from all ages is this fear of, I'm not sure I'm safe here in America. I never thought I would see 1930s, 1939 repeated in my lifetime. We've done Zooms with our college kids, the stories that they tell, they're as bad as you hear. I work a lot with interfaith families. And so we can imagine how challenging that is for people who are trying to explain to grandparents that they don't regret raising their kids as Jews, even though that makes them less safe. I will say though, our conversion class is larger than ever. I think that it's, leading people to ask who their friends are. And we have been both the voice of comfort and also the voice of outrage. We take very seriously our responsibility to bear witness. Rabbi Berg and I were two of maybe 30 people who showed up to watch the raw footage from the Hamas body cams at the invitation of our consulate. We have worked after the December 4th session on gender-based violence a group of us were able to put together a program attended by primarily women to shine the light on gender-based violence. And on the one hand, we can celebrate that we were finally able to get some of our community partners there, but the threshold of just saying it's wrong to rape women and assault minors isn't really a high bar to clear. So I think that what we end up with is in our community, a lot of anger and uncertainty and fear and also a deep desire for community and support. And I'm proud of how people are responding. And it is hard to hear week after week how afraid and rattled people are. I would sum the theme of those conversations as, I don't know who my friends are anymore. And that is extremely disconcerting for anyone, especially a congregation that has people who are assimilated in all manner of schools and workplaces and college campuses and such. We had just a meeting three weeks ago from the Council of European Rabbis in München in Germany, and everybody was speaking about his experience in our country, our city. Everywhere, the Jews were threatened by the possibility to have the disparation of the state of Israel. It was really a great threat also here among the Jews in France. So I saw the great solidarity from all the Jews here in France. Everyone was gathering in, in different ceremonies, manifestations. And also we thought we were a little bit alone. I mean, among the non-Jewish population, we have some support, of course, but we have got some troubles in the inter-religious 
relationships, especially with the Muslims. No words at all, no compassion after the 7th of October. And a few days after, when the war began in Gaza, of course, all the Muslims were shouting and complaining and saying that there were complete solidarity with the Palestinians. So we have taken conscience that maybe their interreligious relations that was very good before, especially with the Muslims, was only, I mean, superficial. So this is one thing. With the Christian, it's very different. We have uh, very good friends among the Catholic Church and also the Reformed Church, Protestant Church. But they want to have some kind of, okay, what was happening on 7 October was awful, but well, the Palestinians are suffering, so on, so on. So they want to keep some equilibrium between the Israeli and the others. Last thing, we have to know that anti-Semitism is not a new thing in France. So I don't know what is with the United States. I think in the United States, it's very new for you. But for us, it's quite a long, long story. I will not uh, speak about what was happening during the war, but it's a long story. And when we have the terrorism in Toulouse in 1220 and then hyper Kasher in Paris, so the Jews are used to this, to this kind of anti-Semitism. What is changing is that the traditional anti-Semitism from the extreme right is disappearing. And now we have the anti-Semitism coming from the Muslims, not all the Muslims, I'm not racist, I'm anti-Muslim, but it's a fact, a lot of Muslims. And in the mosques, they're speaking against Israel, and sometimes uh, the speech are even more, let's say, borderline. And also from the left party, like the same situation you have in the United Kingdom with the Labour Party, they change a little bit, but we have the same situation with uh, the leader of the UK Labour Party, Corbyn. There is a new one, which is better now, but we have the same situation. So all the Jews have to know that what is anti-Semitism, just the anti-Semitism which was coming from the right, now is coming from the left. And we are in the middle. So uh, that is the situation of the Jews here. Just one point more. I can observe that a lot of Jews are coming to shul, even not religious people, but people want to ask questions. They have problems. They want to do something for Israel, to do something for the Jewish people. And that is a really good thing. You see people coming back. I haven't seen them for 20 years or 30 years. Even people I don't know with them were well, coming back to be, I'm Jewish or even not Jewish, but the Jewish origin. And I want to do something for Israel. I think we feel an existential impact and we also feel an existential confusion. I would argue from 50,000 feet that there were five events that shaped the Jewish people more than any other. The Exodus from Egypt, 1492, the Shoah, the foundation of the state of Israel, and I would argue October 7th. And the main reason I would argue October 7th is to echo something Rabbi Starr said, which is it was a shattering of all that we believed. Every premonition was shattered into pieces and we are walking on broken glass right now. I think the confusion comes from two places. Number one is we are a people, we the Jewish people in the diaspora and in particular in America are people that wield access, we wield influence, and we wield connectivity. It is us, the Jewish people, that for all intents and purposes, were the drivers in having Liz McGill leaving uh, Penn and forcing and pushing the question on Claudine Gay. But at the same time, with that access, with that influence, with that connectivity, we are categorizing ourselves as others, which inherently puts us in a category where we don't have any of those things, right? How can you be othered, but still wield enough power to make that level of change? The Secretary of State is an identified Jew. So is the Secretary of Homeland Security. And these are realities for us. I think the second part of confusion for people that lends itself to the shattering is that the United States response to the shooting in Pittsburgh was everything we want it to be. We had empathy from the greater community. Love him or hate him, the president of the United States at the time came and offered condolences. The Pittsburgh Steelers came to the Rosenthal boys' funeral and carried their caskets and put epitaphs on their cleats for them. It was a moment of incredible unity. The Pittsburgh Gazette wrote in Hebrew letters, 
Yikadal Yikadash, on the cover of the Friday paper, which won them a Pulitzer. So this moment of connectivity and unity after Pittsburgh, nothing of it was echoed. Nothing of it was mirrored after October 7th. There was a comeuppance sense. There was a sense of deservedness. There was a sense of it's far away. And all that we had expected in that sense of empathy didn't apply. Now I have a few theories as to why that's the case, but I think it has lent itself to just an absolute bewilderment amongst many in the Jewish community, many who include myself and many in my synagogue. When you say a bewilderment, you'd have to say that the way the American government responded to October 7th, when the president said this is evil and there's no space between the United States and Israel, that wasn't bewilderment. No, my bewilderment is not from a governmental sense. First of all, speaking on behalf of David Kirshner, I think this administration has been pitch perfect in its response in every single way. I wouldn't call out one syllable of anything they've done and how they've responded to this very difficult moment. I'm talking about the bewilderment that Rabbi Lapidus mentioned, which has to do with the idea that people who we thought were our allies aren't there. Yeah. People who we thought were offering us condolences have been absent. People who we were hoping for phone calls to come in and arms around our shoulders would be. I remember post-Pittsburgh, a dozen people showing up at Friday night services who were not of the Jewish faith, who lived in our neighborhood, who said, we needed to be here. And it touched my heart and made my eyes wet. That did not happen after October 7th, and it hasn't happened since. I didn't get calls from any colleagues. I didn't get calls from imams. I didn't get calls from pastors or reverends or priests, and I'm still waiting by the phone. I had that same exact experience. After October 7th, we heard from many people and flowers were sent here. I only heard from one non-Jewish clergy in the area about a month later, but I'm still grateful she reached out. But besides that, complete silence. So why is it so difficult for folks that we thought were our allies in the United States, or at least understood either the Jewish narrative or the Israeli story, that they just went silent? And the most dramatic aspect of that is the violence that was perpetrated against women. Recognizing that so much of what we're talking about, there's an exception to every statement, right? Like my colleagues, I did not hear from many people. I think we're discovering friendships versus collegial relationships. And I think this sense that we were all animated by the same values. One congregant said, I thought we shared the same values as our interfaith partners. And yet it doesn't seem to apply. And I think that I've had people who say, even within our community, I'm pro-Palestinian. And the answer is, okay, well, most of us are, all of us are. We've been in favor of a two-state solution for a really long time. Yet we are not pro-Hamas. We are not pro-Palestinians who are helping to facilitate hostage taking. It has turned into a binary that is false. I work a lot with teenagers. What they are confronted with is this sense that the situation between Israelis and Palestinians is very simple. Israel is the oppressor. The Palestinians are the oppressed. Israel has agency and power. The Palestinians have no agency and power. Therefore, Israel is bad and Zionism is bad. And you cannot support Israel if you say that you are in favor of racial justice, equal rights, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that a lot of people got caught in that or thought that it didn't apply to them. And I can't speak for all of the partnerships. I, I've heard from some people that they don't want to be seen supporting Netanyahu. I've heard this from some people outside the community. It's like, I'm not going to go say much about that. We had 37 weeks of protests against the judicial reform and all of that. I think you can guess how I see pluralism and a variety of things. But this isn't about Netanyahu. I think that people are reducing it to these talking points. After I went and saw this body cam footage, we look around the room, it's mostly Jews. And a few politicians, a few reporters, no other clergy. And it wasn't just hard to look at 42 minutes and realize it's only 10% of the people who were murdered that day that were shown. And it wasn't just that there were only 30 people in the room, but it was then to find out from our consul general that hundreds 
had been invited. The people who weren't in the room were invited. Now, maybe they didn't realize what the invitation was. Maybe they didn't realize bearing witness means something in our community, but they weren't there. And Rabbi Berg and I left just devastated. But there's this other piece, which is I never in my lifetime thought I would see Jews being dehumanized. And I think that's what our partners don't see. For them, it's a political issue. For us, we are looking and saying, mm -hmm. if you see us as human beings, you can't behead a man with a hoe. If you see us as human beings, you cannot rape children and women, and you cannot commit these acts of violence. And the minute we start to think about what if it were our children? What if it were our siblings? What if it were our parents? Because in some degree, they are all ours. Our allies or our theoretical allies, they're not seeing it that way. They're seeing it as it's about the Palestinians and their right to a state. And somehow it's justified. And I think that the healing from this is going to be person by person and relationship by relationship. It is unfortunate that we are now beginning the 2024 presidential election season. We've talked about the anti-Semitism of the left and the anti-Semitism of the right. And I don't think we're going to have the luxury of avoiding it. And people are taking this sense of loneliness and fear and all of that. And we're not sure what to do with it. So. I feel like when I have conversations with colleagues and I say, and again, I'll use the women's event as an example. When we called up our colleagues at Planned Parenthood and ACLU, when I texted my pastor friends, they showed up, but they showed up for women. They didn't necessarily show up for Israel. And that's the next step. I will also add as a woman, the fact that the gender-based violence has stayed at the top of the headlines since the beginning of December, like that, and the hostages talking about it and it just replaying, highly triggering, very challenging. And if we don't talk about it as the dehumanization that it is, we let it get lumped in and passed over. And I think that's actually one of our best chances for getting people to engage in a conversation because it's one thing to say you're anti-Zionist, it's another to say that you're in favor of murdering children and raping women. So if we can put it in those contexts and if we can hold people accountable, I think the conversation shifts. There's not one syllable that Rabbi Lapidus shared that I disagree with. But I think there's an important and there. First of all, to go back to my first point of the confusion, I'm gonna use a personal example. Most Jews I know were incredibly proud of Elise Stefanik's questioning of the three leaders of university and Congress and the way that she held their feet to the fire. That same Elise Stefanik this week referred to convicted felons as hostages. That creates confusion for people where Rabbi Lapidus was talking about the political environment we're going into that puts us betwixt and between. And that's just one kernel of what that confusion looks like. And I think Rabbi Bruno, you mentioned something very similar about the left and the right. I want to dovetail on this piece of why, this is my hypothesis of why I think there has been so much silence by others when it comes to these issues of dehumanizing humans, Jews, Israelis, and women in particular. And that is, there seems to be an inability, a lack of capability for people to hold sympathy for two groups at the same time. If we are to show that we are sympathetic to the plight of Gazans. Well, then by no means can we, we be sympathetic to the plight of Israelis. Tal Becker puts this the best when he says, what really is at play between the Israelis and the Gazans, the Palestinians, is a fight for who gets the award. And whenever someone is given the award, then Kanye comes on and takes it away and says, no, someone else is deserving. And my hypothesis that by removing those kidnap signs and by denying those allegations of rape, by just being blind to them, you are denying the actual suffering because if you leave those up and you say, what is more criminal and cruel than ripping babies from parents' bedrooms and holding them captive without being seen by the Red Cross or any proofs of life? Rape is next to death. And in the Torah, it's equated to death. And when I say Torah, I mean the oral Torah. If we justify that, well, then we're giving the victimization award to the Jews over the Palestinians. And there are people who can't live with that. 
So what they do is they do literally erase the signs and erase the history and turn blind to it because they can't hold empathy for two groups at one time. And I think that is an embarrassment to our society, especially our educated society. And it is a stupid race to the bottom between two groups. And I think it's the and to what Rabbi Lapidus said, not the but, but the and as to why this hasn't happened. I've spent 44 years in education. And one of the general realities is the kids I taught in the late 70s and the early 80s, they understood nuance. They understood that not everything was black and white. I don't know what happened in the education system. There needs to be a measure of understanding that it's not binary. A measure of understanding that history is never linear. It's a sine curve. If you had two groups that you wanted to address, your own Jewish community and the non-Jewish community, who didn't respond, let's say, in the manner that you were anticipating. What would you want them to learn about Israel? You have all said the following. There's a caring and there's an anguish. You said there's a love of Israel. You said we gather together to learn. You said we're curious. Is that the necessary reaction that we should have in trying to be proactive? Where do you want this to be in a year or two? Is this just going to be another Yom HaShoah, a black Sukkot? Is that what we're going to remember this as? Or are we going to do something that's proactive, that makes our community stronger and better, and makes others more aware of the complexity of this? One of our first services after October 7th, my colleague Dove Wilker, our regional director of AJC Atlanta, came and gave a sermon, and it was the songs our children will sing. What will they be singing about this time? And I ask myself that a lot. The power of taking people to Israel can never be overstated. Through the generosity of Leah and Richard Davis, we have a trip for interfaith couples. They are proud Zionists after going. They were skeptical, and then they went, and they saw it, and they love it, and they are engaging. And so we cannot give up on getting our teens and our adults to Israel. I think that we're all going to have to reacquaint ourselves with Israel to recognize that we are in an existential crisis. As Jews in Israel, we can't save things for later. They have to be addressed and we have to see, we have to grow and we have to be committed. We have to educate our children with nuance inside the synagogue and inside of the day schools. We have to teach them how to sit in the uncomfortable spaces and we have to prepare them for what is ahead. Outside of the community, I don't know what I wanna teach. We do have some classes on anti-Semitism and other things coming up, but I wish that they could look us in the eye and say, no, I actually, don't think you have the right, that you are the same because you're Jewish. And I think we have to start calling it Jew hatred. I think we have to start being uncomfortable and stepping forward. And it will be hard, I think, for our community to really demand the accountability of our partners. But I think we can do it. First, inside the community, we have now a difficulty with people with a muna, with a face. Why God lets such a thing? It's the same question. We, we forgot this question from the show. It's a quite a long time ago. So the young people, for instance, my daughter, which is 14 years old, all the children I'm teaching in our Jewish school ask the same question. The show is, is history for them. Okay, so I'm not touching them directly. Now the question is coming back. Where is God? So the first question is this one, and we have to manage it. And simple answers couldn't be answers. It's impossible. Like answers that the Jewish people is make mistakes, averse, where they have done something against the Torah. We cannot say such uh, stupid uh, answers. So we have to manage with this, to study, to manage with this. This is the first thing. Second thing, we don't have in France usually Jews uh, which are inside the community, which are pro-Palestinians. This is very, very rare. And if there are, there are really 
far, far away from the Jewish community. We have not the same problem you have in the United States with Jewish students in university shouting against Israel. So this is not a problem. But outside the community, I think that we have a major purpose to get more and more politicians, more and more French population to our side. How? By telling just the history. The history of Israel, the history of the state of Israel, of the 1947 resolution to explain them. We have some allies. The mayor of the city of Metz has put on the front of the city hall the pictures of the hostages. There are not a lot of cities in France with that we did that, but we have here some allies. So we have to go further. And for instance, we have also some members of the parliament who went to the kibbutzim in Israel to see the real situation. I go myself to a, a place where students, non-Jewish students, in order to explain just the history. We have to do it because they are revising the history in another way, saying that Jews have no right on the state or on the land of Israel. They come like the French or the British come in Africa. So we have to explain the history, why the Jews are living there. And I think that we can touch a lot of people. Now with the Muslims, the situation is very, very difficult. I have one imam, one imam, one imam. There's a lot of imam here in the area, but one imam write me some words. We are with you. That's it. It was a lot of things for him. It was very, really very difficult to send him. And he said to me, okay, don't publish this. I send you, but don't publish this. He's an imam from Morocco. I can explain why, because Morocco is something different with the other imam. So I think we'll not have, in, in short time, really a discussion with the Muslims. It will be very, very difficult. But... I have a hope. We have a poll now in France saying that the majority of the French people understand the action of the state of Israel. So this gives me some hope. And maybe we go further. I think one of the core responses of those of us in the diaspora, and even though our communities are struggling, as we've described in great detail, is to remember whatever we're going through here pales in comparison to what our brothers and sisters in Israel are going through. I have friends who have children in Gaza. That is something that is almost unimaginable for us. And we have an obligation to let the people of Israel know they are not alone. That we in the diaspora are with them, are thinking about them, because their fight is really our fight. The difference is we're protected and they are literally sending their daughters and sons in harm's way and sometimes paying the ultimate sacrifice. And they need to hear from us. They need to know from us. We support them. We're there for them. We grieve with them. We're going to visit them. I'm going to, on my second trip in a few weeks, and we're going to raise money for them. Whatever we can, they need to hear from us. They're not alone. I'm starting to hear more and more from friends and colleagues there. In the beginning, yes, they heard a lot from us, but as the losses continue to grow, the pain is, is just overwhelming. And we really need to remember they're the center. We are not even amongst our pain within our own congregations. That's point number one. Number two, I think we always have to remember Judaism does not exist to fight anti-Semitism. Judaism exists because we have a wonderful, glorious tradition, and we need to take the opportunity. Maybe what has occurred has woken some Jews up in terms of what it means to be Jewish, the Jewish is not to be oppressed, is not to, to fate those who hate us. That's an unfortunate part of our history. But to take this opportunity to say, why be Jewish? And what are the values and the ethics that our tradition, our wisdom, our rituals teach? Because I think that can have a ripple effect onto the world of who we are, who we stand for, and what we represent when our young people are actually able to comfortably say who they are beyond just the fact that I know I'm Jewish, but I actually have no idea what that actually means. 
I don't know how to convince other people. I don't know. I, I That's beyond my scope. But I do think more Jews that understand who we are and the ethics that guide us and the value of human life, the more people that will interact with those and interact with people of more solid standing in terms of their confidence in who they are will have an effect. I think the Jewish people for the last 500 years have known two postures, one of imminent doom and one of invincibility. They're best depicted in the boy in the Warsaw ghetto with his hands up wearing a yellow star and a teenager a little bit older than that boy on a Merkaba tank with an M16 flung over his shoulder. A few days ago when there was the assassination of one of the heads of Hezbollah, one of the people in my office said, yes, a moment of strength for the Israeli IDF. And another person in my office said, oh God, you know what's gonna happen next, right? Imminent doom. These are the two postures that have taken us through history. And frankly, it's time for an alt noi posture. <laughs> we need something different. We cannot go back into one of these two things that continue to compete with each other because there's not space for the other in them. We need to create a new posture that is a bit of a hybrid and a bit of an innovative posture and a lot of pioneering that incorporates history, but also hopes for a future. Because the problem with both of those postures is there's no space for the other in that posture. Find me that pessimist who says the imminent doom is there and they do not understand this idea of strength. And find me the person with strength and they will tell you to jettison this idea of imminent doom. It's time to create a new posture. I think this is an envelope for that to happen. But I think we need to be creative, we need to be bold. We need to sacrifice some of those old and tried texts, if you will, or, or behaviors. And it's time for something new on that front. And I hope that we can find people that will grab our hands and pick up those pens and shovels and begin building that way. American Jewry and world Jewry in general has, because of our great success in the last 75 years, both in and outside of Israel. We've forgotten our origins, much like Adam has said. It would be great to restore our memory and remember that we're not just here because people don't like us and that's the Elmer's glue that stuck us together, but it's the ethics and the values and it's the perseverance and the sacrifice that got this idea of Zionism done I recently wrote a book that just got published called Streams of Shattered Consciousness, and it's about the first 50 days of this war. All the proceeds go to PTSD victims in Israel, and we've sent 4,000 copies to the major Hillel's on universities. It's an important thing that unpacks many of the topics that we discussed today. I am enormously indebted to the four of you for an extraordinary ride intellectually into the impact of Israel's 9-11 on our lives. I think you have collectively given us great glimpses of your communities, your concerns, your caring, and I can use the fourth C, your commitment to who we are as a people.